Americans are having less sex and making too many decisions. Our paralyzing panoply of options makes us sick. Jean-Paul Sartre calls it the vertigo of possibility. So take your power back. Schedule in some sizzling hot sex and pound it like you're busting out of prison. If you feel sick, broke, and boxed in, let go. Have some five-star sex and swing it like you're demolishing an abandoned amusement park. Modern life is hell, our species is doomed, so celebrate. Smash your names into the space-time continuum and knock the boots like you're breaking the lease. If you can't stop daydreaming about casual sex, but you're scared of getting hurt or humiliated and you're burned out on draining dead-end dates with disappointing boy men, stay tuned because hot, dizzy nights of exciting, ecstatic, cathartic sex can be yours when you discover casual sex with Emerson Dameron. Emerson Dameron comes equipped with an omnivorous mind, a soulful, penetrating gaze, and gifts for deep kissing and thrilling, chilling, dirty talk. Get the playfulness, passion, and patience you crave with a dominant, sensitive, and fully present man who knows how to throw you around and when to leave you alone. Make a casual, caring connection and get hot, healthy hookups with a selection of kinky upgrades and a strong probability of cascading orgasms. With Emerson Dameron, fun comes first, and so do you. Have casual sex with Emerson Dameron today, or realistically, early next week. Your problem is that you know you are mortal, you're not good at everything, you're not bulletproof. What you need is the intelligence of someone smart enough to be here and smart enough to take my advice, and the confidence of an absolute moron that interferes with radio signals and brings planes out of the sky. Completely self-destructive, sizzling, sexy confidence that you can only get through cultivating it over time and relegating it to a persona which you want to keep separate. Do not let this persona run for president. Absolutely do not let it run for treasurer. Keep an eye on it, because everything else is just going to happen as soon as you stop caring. What you want to remember about this confidence is that it is first, last, and always fake. It is based on butt kiss, and the reason for that is that nobody can take that away from you. Talk some nonsense into yourself, because you've been making too much sense. Stop doing that. Law number four of the Satanic Buddha, you don't exist, so throw yourself a party. The self, like time, is a useful illusion, and your birthday is the holiest day on the calendar. There is no you, and if there were, there wouldn't be anyone around to observe you. Nevertheless, celebrate yourself, your power, your presence, your magnetism, your wisdom, your courage, your foolishness. You don't have a fixed identity. You have scores of selves, committees, cities drama, intrigue. You've got a Westing Games worth of different selves duking it out for control in there. They're all impermanent, interdependent, and insubstantial. Show them a good time. Indulge. Honor yourself as an animal. Sleep late. Get off. Eat a disgusting meal you love. Rock on with your bad selves. Offer them compassion. Be the best lover you ever had. Love yourself to death. Happy birthday. We open in the main living area of the condominium in Venice Beach, California, shared by the couple Leo and Megan. Leo is an advertising man by trade and of the absent-minded professor type by nature. He is very much in his head, and you would be too. It's a fascinating place. He's a uh, connoisseur, a synthesis of all sorts of different cultural, historical, mythological, philosophical information that's flowing and grinding and churning around in the ecosystem. He's picking up all of it and he's creating something in his head that could either be the ultimate autodidact introduction to human consciousness or absolute crap. He doesn't know himself. In his daydreams, which sometimes are vivid enough and engrossing enough for him to be hallucinations and sometimes are indistinguishable from reality for him in the same way that dreams can be. Leo gets sucked into his daydreams, bright red, sexy blue velvet 
blue, violent, bloodthirsty, romantic, hypnotic, very vivid worlds. He would claim that he experiences what uh, former President Jimmy Carter called lust in the heart. In fact, it is, would be more aptly described uh, as lust in the mind. He is married to Megan. There's a lot of love between these two people. They have become sexually incompatible. Megan is a lot of things. She's deeply spiritual. Uh, she has been staying at home most of the time. She doesn't work. She collects disability. Everyone is diagnosable. Work is for suckers, so I tip my hat. That's not a bad way to go. She is volcanically horny. She spends most of the day jerking off, but that doesn't quite cover what's happening. She is so embodied. It creates a certain magnetism in and around the condominium. People walking past outside can feel it. They don't know what it is. They will uh, sneak into the alley behind the condo and get down to business right there, which only juices up the atmosphere even more. Megan is very much in her body. She's the Peg Bundy of the Kali Yuga. That's Megan's energy, and she almost has to stay home to avoid making a scene. Leo has never created anything. He's never gonna create anything. He's a student of the world. He is uh, having an affair, duh, with a interesting young woman named uh, Gita. Very intelligent, sophisticated, smart, and kind of impossible. Leo wants to crack the code. It's just not happening, but his fascination has spiraled, snowballed, taken on a life of its own. Gita is happy to use him as a uh, vibrator with a thesaurus while she uh, waits for someone to come along who is deserving. And she has another gentleman caller uh, named Steve who um, is an artist. He's a deeply passionate person. Uh, his work is brilliant and he is obsessively in love, limerence is what it is, with a, um, a woman named Leanne who no one ever sees. He talks about her constantly. She's never around. Being in love with someone who is unavailable and accessible, in this case, lives in another city. It's not really established where. Like, she travels around a lot, but for some reason she never comes to LA. There are advantages to being in love with someone who is unavailable and will never reciprocate. You don't have to have relationships with people in your town, which is good. All of them are terrible, but you don't have to be alone because you can have sex with whoever you want. And uh, Steve has been pounding it out with Gita. He does not have romantic feelings for her, which makes her intrigued, but he's also vulnerable and full of feelings, and she's not so crazy about that, and she's just not into his work. But he's swinging it. The sex is good. And that's how Leo and Steve become friends. Leo is on his way in. Steve is on his way out. Steve is, in some ways, uh, Leo's unrealized potential. He is in the arena. He's doing the damn thing. He is making his paintings and drafting plans for buildings. He has to, because if he doesn't, he becomes a pretentious hipster. Uh, Leo is a philosopher, scientist, um, weirdo, but, you know, he's never never going to make anything, but he's fascinated with Steve's work because he thinks that Steve is just right on the edge of doing something fascinating. It's, he's not at, he's not now, but his stuff is very slight. And yet there's, there's a spark there that indicates that he could be onto something tremendous. And he's fascinated by Leo because Leo keeps speaking in his own made up languages and drifting between different modes of thinking and it's just so interesting and they're totally in love with each other. And Gita figures that out and is, is perpetually bored so um, she suggests a three-way. The first attempt doesn't go well. The second
second and third attempts are more successful. And this becomes a, a bit of a routine. Steve recognizes that Leo has stronger feelings for Gita, so he uh, will step out and wander around and sometimes circuitously make his way to Leo and Megan's condo and take care of Megan. Everyone kind of knows that that's going on. It's not talked about specifically because then they would have to talk about it and uh, Leo doesn't really want to talk about it. But it's it's a known thing. So everyone's pounding it out with everyone and uh, the spring turns into summer and it becomes a little routine for Gita especially. She wants adventure. So the three of them, Leo, Steve, and Gita, time for an adventure into the sexual underworld of Venice and Santa Monica. Sometimes they go to basements, sometimes in people's homes, sometimes in abandoned buildings. If you ever wondered what's going on at 909 Oceanfront Walk, just gonna leave it there. Gita is bound and whipped and tortured and called filthy names and realizes that uh, that's not quite doing it either. So she turns it around, puts Steve in bondage. Steve is a uh, man with a surplus of self-pity. So it's it's symbolically interesting. And he talks with Leo about it for hours. He doesn't really get off. And neither does Gita. They still feel kind of bored. But that's just the beginning. They discover new drugs. They go into rooms with lighting and colors that they've never seen before. Not even in the big box of crayons. And in those rooms, they are are finessed by escorts who truly know what they're doing. Individuals of the night will absolutely convince you that they long for you, that they lust for you. It will be the pure experience of sensations of being loved and wanted that you probably won't get in real life. Oyo finds it very interesting to analyze after the fact. Steve is fully immersed. He wishes Leanne was there. She would really enjoy this. This was totally different. This was the frontier. Indescribable. To the point where Steve had a bit of a uh, breakdown. In one erotic encounter was forced to confront his age-old fear of being separated from his family, from the group, being left alone to starve. Being left to his own devices, but being convinced that there's nothing he could do for himself but hope for a quick death, find some honey, pour it over his body, hope that he was devoured quickly by bears, because otherwise starving to death in the worst lonesomeness that he'd ever experienced was simply unthinkable. He had to face that head on. He had to face the full burn of existential isolation. He went home and made some... First, he called Leanne and left five voicemails, each of longer than 90 seconds in duration, which already is too much. She was not responsive. He took all of that through sex transmutation, made the best work of his or arguably anyone else's career. Five stars, no notes, instant summer classic. Galleries in Venice were fighting each other over it physically. Gita discovered that watching gallery representatives beat the tar out of each other is what got her off. Decided to take over the art world, which she did in, in short order. The stuff that she learned in the underworld served her well. Steve got everyone out for his opening night. When they saw the paintings, they were there. Everyone was there. No one did not show up for this. It was jam-packed. And he even invited Leanne, although he was certain that she wouldn't show up. She did. She flew in from Montreal or Pittsburgh or wherever on the other side of the continent. She was living in whatever situation she was living in. She was never totally specific about that. She showed up. When she did, a chill went through the room because Leanne is a demon. There's just no other way to put it. Leanne is awful. She sucked the oxygen right out of the room. Miserable, angry, went around telling people that they should 
leave because they're killing the vibe. Find Steve. Steve doesn't know what to do. He's falling apart. Uh, he he owned the room a few minutes ago. He was on the verge of the biggest breakthrough the art world has seen in a generation. He was owning the world, and everyone was fascinated with him and thoroughly in love with him. Leanne comes through, and he just falls apart. He starts babbling. He doesn't know, but he's actually babbling in the languages that Leo taught him. And... Leanne tells him that his work is crap. She doesn't want to see him anymore. She kind of wishes they never had. Nervous breakdown at what was going to be ground zero for his breakthrough that was going to change the art world and make art relevant again. Now it's just a disaster. Uh, he He's falling apart. People don't know if they should call an ambulance Someone calls 911. Steve uh, says, why did you do that? I don't have health insurance. This is going to ruin it more. Maybe this will fix it. Maybe they'll. if I ruin my life twice, they will cancel each other out. He's losing his mind. Leo is belligerently drunk. He, uh, as the emergency vehicles arrive, starts picking fights with the gallerists who have already been uh, mixing it up with each other. He just started throwing punches and, of course, just got destroyed. Vomiting, coughing up blood, uh, broken bones, severe damage damage uh, in multiple ways, and uh, now everything has changed for Leo. Leo is in his body. He can no longer retreat into the library in his mind. He, no matter how big it is, no matter how many little nooks and crannies it has, he can't get in there anymore because he is in his physical presence and it hurts. It's agonizing. The ambulance shows up. Steve hits the bricks. 23 skidoo. He's out of there. Runs around town in the streets crying. Leo is taken to the hospital uh, where he's treated knowing that his life has changed. Not in a great way. It doesn't seem like so far there could be post-traumatic growth down the line. He's able to zoom out a little bit. He's able to go meta, but it's not good right now. Megan is aware of all of this. Megan has exhibitionist tendencies, which she has turned inward. That's why she doesn't go outside. That's why she didn't show up at the art opening that everyone showed up for. And that's, uh, it's kind of flipped into voyeurism. Uh, she's... She has some binoculars, and she likes to watch the neighbors boning from the window, which is not hard to do. It's Venice. And after a while, she has to ramp it up a little bit, much as people on erotic odysseys will do, and she becomes clairvoyant. She is able to see anything going on in Los Angeles County and parts of Orange County. She is just aware. It's not like a surveillance camera. It's just, it's an embodied awareness. Like you really have to be her to, to know how she knows. And she knows. She knows all of it. It gets her off hard, especially now. The physical destruction of Leo. And she books it to the emergency room and finds out where Leo is, jerks him off furiously for the weeks that he spends recovering, and they kind of sort of reconnect. This has been a special bonus episode of Emerson Dameron's Medicated Minutes, the bite-sized erotic thriller, Solacity and Bloom, celebration of Bloom's Day, which also happens to be my birthday. Thank you. I made it this far. In lieu of flowers or condolences, please donate to K-Chung, uh, kchungradio.org slash donate. That's the radio station where this show usually premieres every first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Pacific. This is a bonus episode, but take care of K-Chung if you 
enjoy the show, donate to K-Chong. If you don't enjoy the show, donate to K-Chong. Tell them to cancel it. That's your prerogative. Music for this episode is by Visions of the Universe. Everything else is by me. I am Emerson Dameron, your witty and wounded romantic hero, producer, writer, and host of Emerson Dameron's Medicated Minutes. I love you personally. Levity saves lives. Medicated-minutes.com. A present, patient, and passionate lover, and a voracious listener, discerning the ways to degrade you that'll make you feel great about yourself. His dry wit brings levity to those and the other indignities of life. He knows when things are too serious to take seriously. He hits the spot, but won't blow up your spot. Hook up with Emerson Dameron this week and make memories you'll never tell your subsequent partners about. With Emerson Dameron, fun comes first, and so do you.